Here's where we left off and where you'll find a complete summary of what the Prairie School is all about. Here, several of Frank Lloyd Wright's signature motifs. First, the windows. Basically, the two main walls of the room are all glass. However, it doesn't feel like that. It's not as if they're crystal clear walls of plate glass. The windows are large, yes, but separated by thick sections of wall, which serve to remind you that there is, in fact, heavy-duty structure protecting you from the outside. And the addition of the leaded glass patterning further serves as a reminder that there is something there. They're not just wide open holes exposing you to the elements. Second, uniting the space with line created by millwork trim, which also houses the lighting and electrical conduit. Next, the open plan is clearly expressed circulating around the central hearth, which is perhaps the most important feature, the fire as the heart of the house. But unlike the medieval, that is, the European hearth motif, this one is set down into the earth, creating a fire pit around which people would sit on the ground, thereby evoking the practices of the people, the Indians indigenous to the American Midwestern Plains. This type of leaded glass window design is also typical of Wright and was usually derived from stylizing or abstracting indigenous plant forms. Also here, a better view of his treatment of architectural lighting. Electric lights were still fairly new, and architects, especially those concerned with creating a unified holistic design, were experimenting with how to work lighting into the design, rather than just placing several lamps around the space. Many of the same themes are seen here in the dining room unifying the space with millwork line that also serves a functional purpose, experimenting with lighting, even building the fixtures into the dining table itself by extending each of the legs up to form lamp posts. Wright's furniture is usually of simple oak construction and clearly inspired by the arts and crafts dictum of truth in materials and construction. Japanese form and lines are also evident here, both directly and as interpreted by Macintosh. The tall, slender lines of the chair backs, which recall Macintosh, all together create a fence-like feeling around the table, sheltering and secluding the diners. Wright felt that the family gathering to eat was almost a sacred ritual and should be protected from outside interference. The sideboard also expresses the influence of Japanese design and its built-in character, along with other similar areas of the room that are not clearly evident, reflect his desire to create a unified total work of art in the Art Nouveau manner. Here, some classic right chair designs from this era. The one just seen, the other two, though, very different and important in that what we see is him playing with pure geometric form, with planes floating and resting in a kind of grid that forms the basic structure of the chair. This kind of thinking and experimentation is exactly the type that will lead to modernism and is what makes him a forerunner. Even the desk, whose connection to Japanese design is clear, also shows him a bit more interested in floating planes than anything else. On the other hand, in these pieces of furniture, traditional, classical elements are clearly expressed, and you should be able to ID them, so I'm not going to tell you what they are. Why would he do this? Most likely to satisfy the client. While many wanted modern design by one of the most progressive architects, they were also often still attached to certain common symbols of sophistication and success. As we've seen in America in particular, that meant classicism, the Renaissance, etc. And since artistic freedom allowed Wright to draw upon any and all sources of inspiration, he could feel comfortable bringing in these references if and when required. However, this leaded glass design of the same era shows he continued his evolution in the avant-garde realm as well. He's no longer working with abstracted plant forms, but with pure abstract form, circles, squares, and rectangles, as well as with primary colors, the fundamentals, the essence of all matter. 
And in this, we see evidence of his awareness and embrace of the latest and most advanced development in the fine arts in centuries, the emergence of abstraction in painting. Here, two of the most important artists and iconic works of this genre and era. Both are paintings which, for the first time, are completely non-representational. Most people are familiar with Kandinsky's work, as their rich colors and dynamism have a powerful emotional, sensual, and decorative appeal. But as we will see, it is the more reserved, intellectual, and geometric version, as seen in the Malevich on the left, which will have the most influence on modernism. One of the most important forerunners in this regard is actually the work and ideas of a group of artists, architects, and craftsmen from Holland. Its leader and primary theorist was Theo van Duisburg, whose magazine, De Stiel, or The Style, first published in 1917, was the main vehicle for the group's ideas and beliefs. An important contributing factor to the aesthetic they developed was, in fact, the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, which became known to them and others among the European avant-garde when collections of Wright's designs began being published there in 1910. Here, one of the drawings from those publications, along with two pieces by the architect and cabinet maker Garrett Rietveld, which clearly embody and express Wright's interest in floating planes within a grid. But for the de Stiel designers, there was much more at stake than just developing a new vocabulary for furniture design. The shock and revulsion the world felt during and after World War I cannot be overstated. The first war to be fought with the aid of machines, such as tanks, chemical weapons, and machine guns. The Great War, as it was called, took the lives of 37 million people in horrific fashion and still ranks as one of the worst wars in human history. During and immediately following it, thoughtful people, shaken to their core, cast about for ways to prevent this ever happening again. And as we know, since at least the time of Pugin and Morris, architects and designers had been concerned with solving deep socio-political and economic problems through design. So it was only natural that they should again want to make a significant contribution. What I state in the box here is the essence of de Stiel's solution to this problem. It was a fact that one of the primary causes of the conflict was nationalism, the severe tension between nations like France, England, Italy, Austria-Hungary. In other words, patriotism, national identity. So de Stiel proposed removing all elements of individual identity, all ego, on both the personal and national level. Quite simply, if everyone is the same, then there will be no conflict. And how do we do this? Much the same as the 19th century de design reformers did, when they wanted to remove all associations with the past, with history, with the style of a particular country at a certain point in time. Remove all the details, remove all the symbols, stylize and abstract the forms. Then, remove all color as well, so there is no chance of making any kind of personal connection. Moreover, when something is abstracted, reduced to its most minimal, to its essence, it is then most truthful and most pure. And when the world is based on truth and purity, how can there be hatred and conflict? Like William Morris's ideas of creating a perfect society through a return to a more innocent time, De Stiel's goal was the creation of a utopia. How did De Stiel express these beliefs in art and design? Quite simply, as I show you here, they envisioned creation as a universal grid system, represented by the black lines we see in Mondrian's painting. And the architect designer creates form by bringing together planes at a certain point in a certain configuration. Van Duisburg's composition on the right shows how planes that are free-floating in the universe are brought together and fixed in one spot to result in a chair, a cabinet, or a house. So adamant were they about pure geometric form that at first circles were not even allowed. And rather than no color, which would make it too difficult to identify the form in space, 
They allowed the use of primary colors, along with gray, white, and black. While most of their work consisted of theoretical images or abstract painting, in the early 1920s, Garrett Rietveld was engaged to build a house based upon these ideas. Schroeder House was designed by Rietveld for a woman who obviously agreed with these concepts. And as you can see, even from the outside, it clearly expresses the idea of planes floating in a grid in space. Here and in the next image, you can see how the grid has become tracks for sliding, moving, floating planes that allow the small space to be adapted to a variety of uses. All color is red, blue, yellow, black, gray, or white, with the white areas often feeling just like open sky in which these floating geometric forms have come together. Here, the introduction of a circle serves as the base for a table composed of floating planes. Apparently, Mondrian was so upset by the introduction of circles into the vocabulary that he left the group. Here, the famous red and blue chair from this project, alongside one of Frank Lloyd Wright's early chairs, to recall that connection. But the red and blue chair clearly expresses the de Stiel theory of objects as nothing more than planes suspended within an infinite grid. The yellow paint at the ends of the black framing elements expresses the innate life energy of the grid emanating from the points where it was cut. Another of the most important forerunners is someone who will himself become not only one of the most important architects of modernism, but of the 20th century. Like Frank Lloyd Wright, Charles Edouard Genre's style evolved over the decades, and he produced many important and unique structures around the world before his death in 1965. Though he spent much of his life in France, he was actually born, raised, and educated in Switzerland. From 1907, he traveled throughout Europe and the Mediterranean and worked as an architect and designer in both Paris and Berlin with and among the most important tastemakers of the era preceding World War I, when France and Germany were both ardently trying to formulate a new modern style with broad international appeal. The so-called domino prototype shown here, developed by him in 1915, marked a major evolutionary step in the open floor plan. But his most important contribution came after he met the painter Amade Ozenfant in 1917, with whom he developed a long-term relationship. It was at this point that he changed his name to Le Corbusier to signify a disavowing of his old life and an embrace of a completely new identity. The name actually doesn't mean anything in French, but it has some kind of personal significance for him. Together, they developed a style of painting that represented their theory of purism, which, as you will see, also offered answers to questions about how to conceive new design, what it should look like, and why. As the name purism suggests, it is closely related to what de Stiel was striving for, but for different reasons and from a totally different viewpoint. While abstract painters and theorists like de Stiel, for the most part, focused on ideal geometric forms as the most universal and pure, Le Corbusier was attracted to the functional and practical forms that the human race had already perfected. Objects like a wine bottle, a guitar, and a pipe, for example, are perfect forms. At some point in the past, after decades or even centuries of experimentation, the ideal form for these functions had been achieved, perfected, and they haven't been changed since. Le Corbusier pointed out that there are already many such forms we can draw upon for contemporary living, and for those we need that do not exist, we can develop new ones by looking to existing perfected forms for guidance. For example, as we know, the Greeks had succeeded in perfecting the temple form, which could serve as a model for new perfect forms of architecture. And we'll see just how he himself used this concept when we return to him as we examine modernism. Last, but by no means least, the German Walter Gropius. 
As early as 1912, he was creating structures that would lead directly to his formation of the new modern style in architecture, later to be known as the international style. He will create this style at the Bauhaus, of which he is also quite famous for being the first director. And it is with the Bauhaus that our study of modernism will begin at the next lecture.